every time we come back to Beijing, it seems there are more people, and especially more younger people. This is so different from the China that we grew up in. It used to just be coal dust and Mao suits. Check it out. <laughs> the founder of communist China on a clock. China is urbanizing at warp speed. The people our age flocking to cities like Beijing. That's one reason Beijing has expanded 20% in the past 10 years. But what does this capital city offer China's younger generation? And how do their new lives in the city affect the country villages they come from? I'm Jeff Hutchins, and I'm a photographer. I'm Peter Hutchins, and I'm a filmmaker. We grew up in China, and now we're going back to capture China in its moment of change. It's hard to believe, but about 100 million square meters in Beijing are currently under construction. The buildings are newer, and the people are younger. Not bad for a city that's more than 2,000 years old. You know, we're 45 minutes outside of the center of Beijing. It's just this tidal wave of construction and development that's rolling through this area. I mean, even the, these farmhouse kind of things that we're walking through right now, I'd be surprised if they're still here in six months. And we've come to the fringes of the city to meet a group that's living on the fringes of society, a Chinese punk rock band. You can hear them pounding out the drums from here. I think this is the right place. So, you know, Subs is one of the few groups in China, the few underground punk bands, to have a female vocalist, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I'm just curious to see how these guys see themselves, you know, in the context of modern Beijing. I think you get a little hard to hear. The cheap rents here in the Tongzhou district have attracted a lot of artists, like Kang Mao and the Subs. Come on. Come out. Nice to meet you. Oh, cool. Yeah, you guys rock. There you go. Uh, uh. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Gambe. Gambe. Oh, Gambe. <laughs> Finish it all. Gambe. Yeah, it's too big. I don't think so. What is it like to be a uh, punk in China? Do people look at you, or do they think you're different, or just they, normal? Maybe they think uh, we are a monster. <laughs> you're a monster? <laughs> really? And most of the Chinese people don't know what is a punk. Punk rock makes up just a small part of the Beijing music scene, and that's why the government allows them to freely create their music. But outside influences, including Western rock music, are putting a lot of pressure on the status quo. What do your parents think of punk rock? My, my mother and father so hate me playing really? punk music, yeah. Why are they so mad? Because they think um, a younger should uh, marry a rich man have a good job uh -huh. and a clear. But Kang Mao isn't interested in following a traditional path. And in Beijing, she can make her own way. I really like punk, you know. I really think uh, I can choose my life. Like Kang Mao, Beijing is inventing its future as it goes along. Sometimes there's a little more freedom, but Kang Mao has to be cautious. Is there anything that you cannot sing about? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Sometimes uh, we say in English is um, safe a little bit. It's a bit safer. safer. Yeah. For example, we have a song named The Brother. It's about um, from um, 1989. No, I'm sure that's pretty sensitive to talk yeah. about that yeah. stuff. And voices like Kong Mao's are starting to be heard. We're going to get to hear them play tonight. Right, Thanks. We'll see you yeah. Tonight. 
we'll see you yeah. guys tonight. Yeah. No, tonight. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. <laughs> In the clubs of Beijing, the rock scene has been quietly growing for more than a decade. So people like Kang Mao may be changing Chinese music forever. We want to see another aspect of Beijing's youth culture. So to find out, we've come to Beijing University to talk to a guy who's close to Kang Mao's age, but on a much more conventional path. Beijing University, I mean, it really is beautiful. We're actually here because we want to talk to someone who's in the Communist Youth League now and about to join the Communist Party. Is this him? Hi. You must be here and Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Lisa. Ah, nice to meet you. Hey, how's it going? Oh, cool. yeah. Li Xiao is in his final year majoring in quantum physics. So you're not only studying physics, but you're also in the Communist Youth League, right? Uh, yeah. What percentage of your classmates are actually part of the Communist Youth League also? Very, very large. Lee says that being a member of the party gives him opportunities and connections. It's interesting that he sees joining the party as a choice. I thought not joining was really not an option. So do you have to be a member of the Communist Party to be in the government? Oh, no, not necessary. Uh, you know, the, uh, the head of the Ministry of Technology uh, now is not a, a, a Communist Party member. Really? Has, has that always been the case? Uh, no, uh, it's just within the five or six uh, years uh, when uh, uh, the uh, president, Hu Jintao, uh, came into the head of the party. He wants to make an important transformation that uh, the government is uh, relatively separate from the party. I ask Li how the Communist Party is changing, and what he says is surprising. They want uh, some, someone can uh, give their uh, own opinion uh, and um, put some uh, suggestions, rather than just uh, agree with them and do nothing. <laughs> so what do you think of something like the Tiananmen Square protests, um, that, that kind of independent thought? Actually, at that time, uh, I was three years old. <laughs> yeah, uh, I heard of that. Uh, I think um, it's okay for people to raise their uh, own opinions, but, uh, I th uh, but it, it's inappropriate to uh, do in that way. Yeah, uh, the, the, um, the most important thing is that you should not disrupt the society. I wonder how Li Xiao feels about his own future. Is he as idealistic as our friend the punk rocker? Is money important to you? Science is more important for me. Li Xiao and Kang Mao are taking advantage of the new opportunities in Beijing. But I wonder what it's like in China's provinces, beyond the bright lights of the big city. We've worked up quite an appetite exploring the city. So we decided to grab a bite to eat. The Chinese are pretty much known for eating everything. Yeah, well there's even the saying in southern China that we eat everything in the air except for planes, everything in the water except for submarines, and everything on land except for a car. It's pretty true. What's that one? Phoenix! Phoenix. Oh, okay, all right. Phoenix is very good. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's, uh, I'm gonna take your word for that. Let's stick on this side of the table here. <laughs> wow. Starfish? Yes. Yeah? It's good? Starfish! It's a mature jagger. How do you eat it? Everything? Okay. Well, it's not too bad, at least. No. Halfway edible. No. We're going from star fish to our favorite Beijing punk rock star. This is the club where Kang Mao is playing. From the small crowd, it seems punk is still barely making an impact beyond the subculture. But Jeff and I are definitely in the spirit of things.
man, you guys are awesome. Oh, that was, that was so great. Yeah. <laughs> you had it. Oh my god. <laughs> you like it? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, but, uh, so I don't know, maybe it's stupid. A little, yeah. stupid. A little stupid. I forgot. <laughs> but it's, they're your band t-shirts. t-shirts. Yeah. Oh, the t-shirts are good. Yeah. 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 That was so great. Thanks for showing us oh, some, of, some of the edgy really? side of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank really you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank cool. you. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Okay. See you later. See you later. <laughs> All right. Bye. 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 Jeff, I think we got to change. <laughs> the next morning, Pete and I visit one of our favorite places in Beijing, a neighborhood called a Hutong. Hutong translates to alleyway. The alleys link quads of houses surrounding courtyards. There are only about 400 Hutongs left in Beijing, but they have an incredible population density, about 49,000 people per square kilometer. I love these old doors. And the reds and the grays, I mean, the Hutongs have such a cool feel, like you feel in a back alley. Yeah. And it's so quiet too, which is the other thing that's you know, pretty big contrast from the rest of Beijing. Yeah. But this way of life could be disappearing. China's urban population is exploding. It's expected to reach 1 billion by 2030. Some of the hutongs are being replaced by taller apartment buildings that house way more people than one story single family hutong houses. More than one million Hutong residents have already been displaced. I wonder what China's youngest generation thinks of the changes. Yeah. Hello. 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 What are you, what are you guys doing? Playing ball. You do? You live here? 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 Oh, you live over that way. You live over there. Uh -huh. We can see your house. Can you see your house? Okay. Okay. Cool. This would be a cool neighborhood to live in as a kid, yeah, you know? Yeah. Just run around. You don't have too much traffic to get in the way of your uh, soccer or yeah. whatever you're playing. When the hutongs are demolished, kids like these often end up living in apartment buildings. Oh, really? So, so if you live here, you have a ton of friends, you know them all, but if you live in an apartment building, you don't know anyone. In the hutongs, life is communal. It's all about connecting with your neighbors. Dozens of households share a single entrance and even public bathrooms. This is cool. Yeah, this is cool. This looks like one of the kind of older ones, too. That's great. Yeah. You know, they call these places um, zai yard, which means eclectic yards. Because oh, really? these used to be, you know, the, the courtyards of gentry, and then people just started subdividing them and, and building you know, yeah. all of these crazy places. Yeah. And it's neat how many families actually usually live in these places. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a. Very cool. Hey. Ah, you have you guys lived here? Oh, okay. uh, so you've lived here for three years. Yeah. Okay. 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 So you moved here from an apartment building to the hutong. That's that's interesting. That's actually opposite of what so many people are doing. Yeah, exactly. In apartments, people have modern amenities, but they lose the connections at the heart of the hutongs. Some people don't want to give up the sense of community, even for the conveniences. I wonder how Wang Ying feels. Do you prefer to live here? Many people believe it's healthier in the hutongs because living on the ground floor is closer to the Earth's energy. That's one of the things I love about being in, you know, being in China is right. it feels like you can just strike up conversation somewhere and, and people always invite invite you over and no one expects it <laughs> to, you know, just two white guys wandering around to speak anything. It's got to be where all the birds are flying to, this guy up on the roof here. Yeah. Should we see if we can get up there somehow? Yeah. Oh, uh, Niha, Shenshan. We can go up. Can, can, can. Come on. 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 Come
Cool. Okay. Hey, you're welcome. 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 You're But I'll bet it's dying out as buildings get higher and higher, especially here in Beijing. How many pigeons? How many pigeons? Oh, more than 40. Given the stresses of modern Beijing, the birds help him relax after work. Do you prefer to live here or in like the newer areas? So I like this one. This is where he yeah. was born. This is right, where he's right. lived, and so of course, yeah, he loves it. Beijing modernizing so fast, I'm glad some of the old traditions still exist. I've heard they have to update the maps every three months just to keep up. Makes you appreciate the surviving hutongs all the more. These neighborhoods are great because you've got all the same, you know, it's the people who live here that are shopping here and right. businesses here. And Song Yo Bing? Is that really Bing? Green onion pancakes. These things are amazing. They're super simple onion pancakes, but they're delicious. All right, here we go. This will take you back, huh? Yeah, man. That's perfect. Oh, yeah. That's really good. Nothing like walking through a hutong with a Song Yo Bing in your hand. I mean, that's kind of the idea, too, in Beijing. The parts that I really appreciate are the, the things that that are sort of the simple, like that, you know, it's not like the new flashy cars right. and buildings and everything, but like, just like a green onion pancake, I mean. Right. <laughs> this place really is its own thing. It's not trying to be yeah. something else. As much as we're enjoying Beijing, Pete and I are feeling a little run down. Yeah, well, we've been on the road for months. I mean, it's it only makes sense that we're feeling a bit sluggish today. I know, you're sporting headaches. I can't sleep a wink. We're thinking some traditional Chinese medicine is just what the doctor ordered. I've had insomnia for probably the last 10 years. About 10 years? <laughs> yeah, oh, it's just taken me a while to make an appointment. Long, yeah, long medical history. Uh -huh. Heaviness, uh, soreness, uh -huh. sometimes like a The doctor tells me I might feel some heaviness or soreness. Okay. Yes. Yeah, right now it feels like Yes. <laughs> Pins in my face. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Acupuncture has been around for at least 2,000 years. It's believed to have begun in the Stone Age with the use of a sharp stone to treat disease. And now it's used to balance qi, life energy. Some modern studies suggest that acupuncture stimulates the nervous system, which emits biochemicals that promote healing. Okay, cool. What kind of feeling? Uh, that one was a, a, a bit, uh, didn't feel good. Dr. Wu Li Hong uses a special method to unblock my chi, so I can sleep. He applies a very low level electric charge to the needles. I can feel the electricity coming through. It's like little, little pulses. Definitely stronger than a shock. Yeah, it's not comfortable. I wouldn't say it's comfortable. I hope the doc can cure my headaches without using too many needles. I've always had a bit of a fear of needles. What is this called? Cupping? Cupping. <laughs> oh. That's such a weird feeling. Cupping is a therapy over 2,500 years old. It improves blood circulation by bringing fresh blood to the area. It can also open up the lungs. It's most often used to treat aches and pains and respiratory illnesses such as chest congestion and wheezing. Your skin just starts getting sucked into the glass. I guess the flame creates some kind of suction. Mm -hmm. So I'm being poked and pulled, and I don't even get to see it coming. For you, I think maybe three minutes to five minutes is, is, is enough. So do you find in Beijing, even with uh, newer types of medicine or different types, do a lot of people still use acupuncture? Yeah, 
Uh, Jen, Jen, this is different hospital and different treatment for patients. For example, our hospital is acupuncture hospital or traditional Chinese medicine hospital. Most patients use herbs and acupuncture. Chinese medicine doesn't have any side effects. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, uh, also it's uh, for the economic. economic. Oh, it's cheaper. It's cheap. Okay. Is that all of them? Okay. He tells me it'll be a couple of days before the circles disappear. Everyone is finished. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah, you're welcome. Welcome. Cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very okay. much. Ah, you're welcome. That was great. Ah. So I should sleep okay. like a baby. Okay. I hope you have good good sleep for tonight. Thank you. Okay. After a treatment that puts us a little outside our comfort zone. We're ready for some Chinese comfort food. You getting hungry? Yeah, I could definitely go for something to eat. I think there's the dumpling place just up the road, the Jiaozi place. Yeah, it's not too yeah. far. Unless this is it. No way. I sure this hope is this it. isn't it. Oh, this is totally it. <laughs> Jeez. You're kidding me. It just comes and goes at such an exponential rate, it's unreal. Yeah, I mean, this was here like, what, a year ago probably? You wanna wow. at least explore it? May as well, jeez. It's so surreal. I mean, it really, it feels like a war zone or something. Yeah. Just walking over rubble. Hey, check out the mannequins. You know, the amazing thing is this is physically what change looks like. The speed of change is staggering, too. In just two years, 120,000 homes were demolished, and more than 300,000 people were displaced. With all the destruction, it's good to see this hutong restored instead of torn down. I wonder whether people will miss the old architecture and the way of life once the newness wears off. I guess so many people in Beijing are new to the city that they don't even know what old Beijing looked like. Beijing is a prime example of the global phenomenon of urbanization. People leaving the country for the city. And it's crazy to think that so much of this work is being done by the migrant laborers. You know, they actually call them the smokeless factories. I've heard that one in four Beijing residents is a migrant from the farms. They come here to work and escape rural poverty. We're lucky enough to meet one of the migrants to find out what he thinks of all this. Li Hongzhong is from Hunan province, about 1,500 kilometers south of Beijing. Hunan is one of the main provinces that the city's migrant labor comes from. Why are you in Beijing? Okay, so he's here to work, basically. Do you prefer Beijing or Beijing? Your... He likes Beijing, but he misses his family. So what he likes about Beijing is, you know, it's there's things like Tiananmen Square and, and there's a lot of cool things you can buy, but the tough things are it's actually hard to find work. There's so many migrant laborers and then um, things are really expensive here too, so yeah. the money probably doesn't go very far. So it would take a long time for the people of Beijing to do this without right. all of the outsiders coming in. Your father what do your parents do? So, so they're farmers. I guess they probably are just barely eking by, and so for him to come out to the big city in some senses and work out here is going to be one of the best ways for his family to survive, really. Mm -hmm. It must be such a culture shock for people like Li Hongzhong when they come to Beijing from the provinces especially when they have to work on a skyscraper, like this one. We're going to have to venture out beyond the city walls pretty soon to check out rural life. Meanwhile, we can see why the migrants come here for work. About 100 million square meters of Beijing are currently under construction. But the people who will live and work in these buildings will be from a very different strata of society. They'll be Beijing's wealthy elite. You really do see cranes everywhere here, don't you? You want to get up there? Hell yeah.
All right, this definitely looks high enough to make you a little woozy. Oh, it? man. <laughs> yeah, grab onto the rail. All right, Pete, don't go teetering off. Mom would kill me if I lost you. So they, they come from all over China. I think there's something like 150 or 200 million migrant workers in China, which is a seriously mind-blowing figure if you think about it. Yeah, I've, I've actually read that there are more migrant laborers in China than the entire population of the UK, France, and Australia combined, which is just staggering. Looking out over the city makes me think of how far away the migrant workers come from. But how much of Beijing is filtering back to their hometowns? Or is life pretty much unchanged in the provinces? We're going to find out. We're about to trade the urban frontier of Beijing for the wilds of Inner Mongolia. So Jeff and I are off to Inner Mongolia to find out how they're dealing with the changes. I love Chinese trains. You got your hard seat, your hard sleeper, and thankfully, Pete, we got the soft sleeper. Yeah, I think we've done our time on the hard seats, Jeff. Plus, it sounds like uh, this might be the last bit of luxury we get on this trip. All right, this is us, number four. Wow. <laughs> I forgot how small these places are. I can't believe we used to fit the whole family in one. Jeez. We're heading as far from Beijing as we can get, for some perspective. Our destination is Inner Mongolia, Beijing's polar opposite, you could say. It's about a 30-hour train ride, and my brother is making it seem even longer. <coughs> what? Oh, that is, oh, come on. A pond does not move like that. That's that's the jumping pond of Asia. You haven't heard that? There are a whole, a whole new set of rules right here. I can't believe you're cheating all the way out here. All right, fine. Well, if any piece can move anywhere, take that. Fair enough. As our chess game heats up, we're thinking about how cold our destination is. I can't believe we're about to go to a place that has 130 frost-free days a year. This is going to kick our rear end six ways from Sunday. Yeah, so that means two-thirds of the year this place is frozen solid. Frozen solid like your king, checkmate. What? Our games never last long. Man, this is ridiculous. After a 30-hour train ride from Beijing, we're traveling almost two hours from the train station in Hailar to the Bayan Hushua village. We've changed modes of transportation from a train to a camel-drawn sleigh. I must be dreaming. Back in the 12th and 13th centuries, Mongolia was the home turf of Genghis Khan. Look at all this space. Inner Mongolia is China's widest province, and there is uh, nothing out here almost. Talk about a place that's frozen in time. It's more than 30 degrees below zero Celsius. I mean, there's nothing to stop the wind out here. It just kind of stings your face when it hits. Yeah, my eyes are constantly watering. I tried pulling down my mask, but there's, there's no way. It's just way too cold out here. You know what kills me is we've got camels pulling us, and I <laughs> completely thought camels were a desert animal. That's the thing I love about China. The contrasts are so extreme. One moment, we're in a fast-moving metropolis, and the next, we're on a frigid steppe. Our guide is Zhao Jing, a native Mongolian. So Zhao Jing, are you taking us to their village? Yes, uh, taking to Bayan Hushou village. They are celebrating Nadam meeting. Nadam translates to three games of men. No kidding. It's an ancient nomadic version of the Olympics. Athletes compete in three sports, archery, horse racing, and wrestling. But Nadam is traditionally held in mid-July. Why on earth would they hold it in midwinter? Right now, even Zhao Jing is freezing. <gasps> in winter, you usually what? Uh, stay home. Don't go to, go out <sighs> because it's very good. <sighs> Bayan Hushou Village, our destination is in sight. 
and we've never been so happy to see a yurt. I just hope it's warm inside. I'm so glad we're here. <laughs> yeah, about time we get warm. Sure is. This place is cool. Yeah. So can we go in? Yeah, I must tell you about some taboos about this Mongolian yacht. Okay. There's some okay. taboos before yes. we go in? Okay. Yes. Uh, you can't. If you enter the Mongolian yacht, you can't touch the threshold. And uh, you don't take your whip into the Mongolian yacht. Okay. And <laughs> the man must sit in the west and the woman must sit in the east. And uh, you can't touch the children's uh, forehead, okay? Okay, and okay. no cursing the horseman's dog too, isn't that right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard that one one time. Okay, so leave your whip outside, right? <laughs> okay. And don't touch the children's foreheads. Yes. <laughs> Especially not with your whip. <laughs> so we sit in the west. That's right. Yes. I would not sit in the east. Okay, great. Zhao Jing says the reason is that the east side of the yurt is where the women keep their cooking utensils, while the men store their gear on the west side. Zhao Jing translates both the Mongolian language and local customs for us. All right, so what am I supposed to do here? Yes, do when you drink it? this, yeah. you should use your first finger and then dip, dip it. Uh -huh. uh, do it like this. It means respect to the heaven. The second, it means to respect to the earth. The last is, is respect to ancestor. Yeah. So, one to heaven, yeah. one yes. to earth, and one for my ancestors. Eat it up. Eat it up? Yeah. Okay. The spirits pack quite a punch. Mm. That's strong stuff, isn't that it? That is very strong stuff. <laughs> okay, yeah. very wow. good. It's easy like this. Yes. So we wear the soka. Uh, Offering a blue ceremonial scarf to a guest is actually a Mongolian sign of respect. Feel very regal, Jeff. Yeah. I think things are about to change a lot more. They just discovered a huge coal deposit nearby. And with all the new people and machinery, it may be hard to preserve this culture. So, Zhao Jing, you said they were expecting us for Winter Nadam. Is Winter Nadam a tradition in Inner Mongolia? Oh, no. Modern. It's only for the tourism. Yeah. Only for tourism? Yeah. So they, they've changed the old festival. I mean, a festival that's been around since Genghis Khan. It's hard to believe, but in the year 2000, the Chinese government started a Winter Nadam just to attract tourists. It's yet another change in lifestyle for a people who were once nomadic herders. Well, I mean, if you think about it, so much of their lives have changed over the last, you know, 20, 50 years, basically. They used to be nomads. Now the Chinese government seems to have, um, you know, kind of collected them and made them stay more in these permanent settlements. And now it looks like tourism is basically, the, you know, kind of the meat of their livelihood. In this area, tourism has provided some jobs. But in other parts of China, people have to leave their home provinces to work as migrants in the cities, like the workers we met in Beijing. Zhao Jing, do they get a lot of tourists here? One or two thousand visitors every year. Yes, two thousand. Wow. Yeah. It's time for Nadam. But today, it's just us. Maybe it's too cold for the tourists after all. Well, we're definitely up for it. Let the manly games begin. Let's go. All right, here we are at Winter Nadam. Yeah, and as far as the wrestling goes, it looks like the only rule is the first person who hits the ground is the loser. All right, you ready to dust yourself off? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to dust you off. We start with 16 men and wrestle in pairs until the last man standing. For round one, Pete and I will wrestle each other, and that suits us just fine. I want you. I want you. <laughs> Your number's up, little one. You know, Jeff, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. This dog has been chained up for a long time, but he is ready. Ready? 
Genghis Khan used wrestling to keep his men in great fighting shape. And his brothers, we love a good fight too. Sorry I had to beat you out there, big brother. Hey man, I let you in. I didn't want to have to face one of those guys. But you're gonna do great. Go get him, make us proud. He's gonna get killed out there. I beat Jeff, which is great. But now I have to wrestle one of the Mongolian guys. And genealogy shows there's pretty much an 8% chance that my opponent will be a direct descendant of Genghis Khan. And I say, better Pete than me. Oh, okay. Pete's about to get worked. They're shaking hands, but it's all ugly from here on out. He's gonna get chucked around like a rag doll. Uh-oh, he's trying the old psych him out move. Let's see what he's got. This is all strategy here. Come on, Pete. Good job, good job. Hey, down by contact. You did your best. You made us proud. I still let you win. Good job. How can we be dressed like this and not walk into the sunset? You know, Jeff, I think Genghis Khan would be proud of the Hutchins brothers today. I think you're right. And I think my pants are falling down. You know I let you win. As temperatures drop overnight, we're glad to be snug in our yurt. Looks like one high calorie uh, platter over there. I guess you have to eat food like that to stay warm out here, huh? Do you mind pouring some tea? Yeah, I'll get that. That's that yak milk tea, isn't it? Yeah. This stuff's good. It tastes like salty milk. It's not too bad. You want to call it a night? Yeah, let's do it. Let's go to bed. Y'all set? Yeah. Today is the archery competition, but I doubt Pete and I can beat Genghis's kin at this game either. Oh, oh wow. whoa. Jeez, that was right on. Shot. Holy cow. Whoa. Man. All right, these are the guys we got to get teaching us. Yeah, for sure. So the last time I did this was whiddling my own bow and arrow when I was five years old. Okay, I have it upside down, that's a start. <laughs> like this. So straight in the arm, straight in the head. Hey! Hey! Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> See? <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. I just hit the target. I know you did, good job. I almost hit the two guys standing over there. Wow. Oh, a little high, a little <laughs> high. Man, look at these bows that they're using. They're out here, you know, in the traditional garb, but they're shooting these, like, things which look almost futuristic, you know? Yeah. The modern bows seem like a sign of change, but the sport itself is deeply rooted in the past. I mean, they used to do this training for archery to, to keep their skills fresh for war. And I imagine they also use it to hunt out here. The targets that they're shooting at are actually, you know, they're down on the ground as opposed to being raised up, which is kind of interesting. I mean, that must be the kind of level that they hunt on, you know, just a lot of ground kind of animals running around. Yeah, maybe back in the day they would have shot at person height, but <laughs> I guess there's not much reason anymore to be warlike. With the Nadam Olympics over, we come in from the cold and enjoy a Mongolian banquet. That's a good spread. <laughs> and the music out here, a thousand kilometers from the punk scene in Beijing, makes us feel like we're in a totally different country. I'll bet the people who come from villages like this to work in the cities feel the same kind of culture shock. Even all the way out here, there's a taste of the big city. 
<laughs> wow, I don't even know what most of this stuff is, but we're being well taken care of. <laughs> Look at these guys going to town. You riding the horse? You riding the horse? Yeah. Oh, he's horse racing. That's straight up Mongolia style. <laughs> One other thing I notice here is that people of all ages hang out together. It seems there's less of a separate youth culture than in Beijing. I love this place. You know, China's northeast is so hearty. Everyone, everyone that we see here in Inner Mongolia, they have that spirit that allows China to adapt and grow and change. It's amazing. I think you need more yak milk tea, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Cheers to the great northeast. <laughs> Everyone's been so kind about including us in the festivities here. But I guess in China, many people aren't as lucky. It seems to me that people like the migrants probably always feel like outsiders looking in. As for us, we're heading back to Beijing and it feels like we're going back to the future. In the provinces, we discovered how hard it is to make a living. But some people who come to Beijing really make it big. We're about to meet one man who made his fortune here. And some young people who came to the city to become big stars in an ancient sport. But these young people are turning the sport on its head, literally. What are you guys up to? They've all been doing this since they were little, and they start with one plate and then two plates. This looks pretty tricky. Okay. <laughs> Chinese acrobatics have been around for at least 2,500 years. Plate spinning was one of the earliest acrobatic arts. So all of these plates and stuff, this came from everyday objects that people found around the house and then started playing with, so. That's a good way to dry your dishes. The practice plates are plastic and designed so they're easier to spin, but not for Jeff. <laughs> all. all right, this is actually what we want to be doing. <laughs> a lot of the young acrobats are from rural Sichuan province, where they learn this ancient art. <laughs> But they made it new and exciting for Beijing audiences. Jeez. I can't figure uh, out. All right, how now to look, do it. they, they just keep getting more and more spectacular. No way. Watching them perform, I can understand how China has become a top international competitor in acrobatics. Yeah. She's sporting an entire tree with no way. four chicks. That is wow. insane. Look at her concentration, too. She's just totally keyed in. I just hope she doesn't sneeze. Oh. The acrobats tell us they love being here with other people their age, coming up with new ideas, and perfecting their art. I think we should show In them some hand, more acrobatic I mean, moves. Are you ready? Are you I'm ready. ready. I'm okay. ready. And go. Go. Lift me up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Concentrate. Whistle. <laughs> All right, I think she's going to try and get on my head. <laughs> 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 you sent her flying away. <laughs> this is known as swallow play. The performers imitate swallows as they leap through the rings. Oh, nice. Nice. Oh, <laughs> Grace. It's all about grace here at the Hutchins Acrobatic School. All yeah. about grace. Those acrobats were just amazing. But everything about this city is. It's really a place where people come to realize their dreams. And for some, that means capitalizing on Beijing's newly cosmopolitan tastes. Man, that's a pretty nice place. It's only been in the last 10 years or so that there's been this creation of a new wealthy class in China. So Jeff and I are going to meet a guy named Henry Lee, who's part of Beijing's new wealthy class. So, uh, so 
How did you first come to Beijing and, and start, uh, start making your fortune? When I came to Beijing in 1995, one day I was walking down the street of San Li Tun, right? I found this little bar there was empty, nobody. So I asked them, I said, is this shop for sale? They said, yeah, for sale. So they sold it for me for 10,000 RMB. Wow. So that's how I get my, my first place to, to, to go in. So when you're wealthy in China, does the government watch you more closely than if you're not? No, people like you, you know. People always like to shake rich people's hand, you know. And being rich is beautiful, you know. You live in a bigger room, you know, you have a maid, you know. You can dine in a restaurant, you drink champagne, you know. I mean, what's wrong to being rich, you know? I mean, it's a wonderful feeling. Great, Henry offers to show us a night on the town in the posh clubs of Beijing. This is Henry's favorite hangout. It's a far cry from Kong Mao's punk rock club in the yurts of Inner Mongolia. But it's fitting for a communist capital that seems ever more capitalistic. Urbanization and newfound prosperity are changing the very character of Beijing. In many ways, the city seems to reinvent itself every day. This Thank is you. so different than uh, the Beijing we used to come to in Peru. Nice. As long as you have a dream, this is a wonderful place. It's better than Hollywood. Many of the people we've met in Beijing do have a dream, whether it's a way out of rural poverty or the chance to follow their star in music, science, or business. You see it in every face in Beijing because everyone is a part of the new urban revolution. When you think of it in human terms, too, it's not just a, a faceless changing skyline. It's also thousands and thousands of people whose lives are being changed, who are moving from their you know, original homes. It seems like every time we come back to Beijing, something huge has changed. <laughs>